Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, I am, as I said, quite a mouthful <laughs> at uh, AMM in the CSR. Uh, I'm also a visiting, appointed as a visiting lecturer here, here in, in this department, although I've only had the pleasure of, of visiting. Um, <laughs> if you do see any, any potential uh, for collaboration or discussions between yourself or one of your, one of your colleagues, please, 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 uh, you know, let's have a discussion. Basically, I'm going to start off with uh, what is the flat strip roll process. Essentially, a, a piece of bulk material is rolled between various rollers to reduce its thickness. So it's, it's just a typical uh, metal processing plant. So they start off with bulk pieces of metal, roll it thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner, up to whatever they need. If they need sheet metal, then that goes into forming and, and, and so on. And you get hot as well as cold rolling. So hot rolling typically is at Elevated temperatures where the material is allowed to recrystallize, uh, whereas cold rolling is just a, a hardening and a very, very fine surface finishing process. And uh, typically, why we want to uh, model this is, is uh, and you can see typically there's quite a lot of uh, closed form expressions and, and uh, math to solve problems in terms of what is the torque required to pull a piece of metal through a particular size of rollers and these things. The reason we want to go a step deeper is to actually look at the temperature and rate effects of this rolling process. So rolling the same piece of material at a slightly elevated um, temperature means the torque required is less. Um, but obviously there's an additional energy input in terms of heating the material up. Apart from that, you could roll it slower. So there are, there are rate effects as well. So you could roll a piece of material at slower you know, uh, processing uh, parameters, um, and then again, you would you would reduce the amount of energy required per bulk material processed. But then you have to decide on how much you can process, how slow can you go, what is the cooling rate, and these kinds of things. So we might be interested in actually minimizing the energy of the bulk volume of the product manufactured, or looking at the actual microstructure of the material. Um, just a quick little video on what, what this typically is. That is a, a, a massive piece of uh, metal. Metal slab is about 20 millimeters thick. And this goes into a furnace, heats it up. In this specific case, it's a, it's a high strength alloy. It's heated up to around 1,200 degrees uh, Celsius. And then it gets rolled, washed. So you'll see very soon, as soon as they move it, you see there's this scale that forms on the surface of the material. This is washed, and then it's, it's kind of rolled to the process. There are different ways of rolling. Uh, bulk material. So in this specific case, you'll see a, a four roll stack, support rolls, and the actual work rolls touching the material, typically of a, of a high ceramic and so on, because it's in contact with a very high temperature material. And it gets rolled through to one side, and as soon as that's done, it's rolled back. So it, it's, it's rolled to and fro to reduce the thickness. You can see the thickness was reduced, and it's rolled back again. So that's, that's kind of the process we're interested in modeling might seem like a fairly trivial process, but it's, there's, a, there's a lot going on in terms of the material. So as I mentioned, again, the motivation is typically saying, if we look at, let's say, for example, a design of a 300 millimeter thick piece of steel, and we're doing three tandem rolls, and we want to reduce it to a total thickness of 220 millimeters, what do we need to do? Let's say we have three rolls. Do we need to first do a very, very, very large reduction, then a slightly smaller one, and then end off with the Within 90 centimeters on each side, or do we do we how do we change these these rolls and the, the velocity at which they they, they manufacture the bulk product? To do this, we need to uh, to have an environment to solve these boundary body problems. But first of all, um, setting up the boundary body problem, uh, we would want to first of all try and simplify the domain as far as possible. So. In this case, because of the symmetry of the problem, we'll just look at one half of it. Um, this is a, we're assuming a, a sufficiently thick piece of material that we can use a plain strain assumption. So we're assuming no, no, no change in strain in the thickness of the material. That's why we can kind of get away with 2D here. Um, then we want to have a look at what we need to apply in terms of boundary conditions. So we need to look at contact formulations. We need to look at material models. We need to look at prescribed displacements and velocities and all these kinds of things. And perhaps also look at heat transfer um, between the roller and the slab and all these things. So again, you can see, I mean, it's, it's very simple schematic, but there's, there's a lot of physics going on there. 
To solve the bounty, uh, bounty value problem, my go-to is the finite element method. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the finite element method. I'm going to give a very quick little introduction to the displacement-based formulation. Essentially, if you look at the material, we have an arbitrary domain of material that we want to model, and we have equations of state. In here, you can see typically just the, the main one here is the, the uh, linearized you know, conservation momentum. You can just see the, um, the, the, the Cauchy stresses is essentially a measure of the true material stress. Um, and then we have various tractions and displacements and so on on the boundary. Now, we start off by taking the strong forms of the governing equations and putting them into a variational formulation. In this specific case, I'm looking at large deformations, which means that the analog in a Lagrangian strain formulation is the second girl of Kirchhoff stress. Um, that's the one you see there on the left. The big problem is going to be how do we model this? There's a lot of software that actually does a lot of the solution for you, like sets up the linearized sets of equations. But we want to actually have a look now at how do we model temperature and rate dependent effects of the stress. And in this specific case, the affine transform, affinely transformed stress. So the transformed stress in terms of the large deformation uh, strain formulation. Quick, basically, what we have in terms of the um, finite elements. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, that's Great, that's, that's good news. <coughs> Effectively, what we do is we break up our complex domain a finite set of regular shapes, in this case, isoparametric elements. So we know the shape functions throughout these transformed elements, and we can kind of integrate our variational formulation um, over the total computational domain. We can take each specific element, add it into a linearized set of equations. We have a massive matrix, displacements and forces, and then we, we kind of balance these. It's a highly nonlinear process in a large deformation type sense, and uh, also particularly in the in highly nonlinear material model formulation, which is why we obviously then use you know various uh, techniques. Not not very, I mean we have the 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 consistent tangents of the material formulation, so we do use uh, uh, newton absent type method with line search just to kind of like look at the the highly nonlinear um, interaction between the forces and displacements and material of these two displacements. Basically, just to run through a quick little diagram of how we solve this. Um, if you look at the, the right there, you'll see typically you'll have an estimate of what your displacement is. You would take these displacements either in rate form or in, in, in total the Lagrangian displacement formulation, convert that into some measure of material deformation and stresses and these things, and then pull that up into the um, weak form of your governing equations and just iterate among those to, to find the correct displacement that produces a, a, the lowest residual of, of, of your system. As I said before, what we need to look at really, I and mean really what I did and what I look at is looking at the stress formulations and how to implement different material models into existing biodynamic factors. And this is the case, again, as I said, you have displacements from your displacements over an element using its isoparametric shape functions, you can derive deformation gradients, you can use that to determine the material deformation uh, in terms of strains, you can calculate the stresses out of that and pull that back up into the higher system of gradients. To do this, we need a metal specifically now, we need to have a bit of an understanding in terms of deformation, permanent deformation and plasticity in metals. So to do that, I have this, this simple little equation, and you can essentially see each of these spheres are metal atoms and various atomic bonds between them. And they're packed into a simple little lattice in this case. And you can see as we apply stress to it, they stretch and stretch and stretch. And this is purely elastic deformation. None of the bonds were switched or broken or shifted. And as soon as you leave it, it, it goes back to its original shape. In terms of permanent deformation, you overcome some of these atomic bonds and slip happens. But typically it happens because of impurities and faults within the material. But I mean, even if you have a, a pure material, it'll typically slip along a slip direction. So specific bonds would break and, and move on to, uh, uh, onto, onto different atoms, so you eventually have a permanently deformed material. Here you can see something very similar, yet again, 
if you look at the the slip plane, as soon as the yield stress is overcome, there's a, there's a, a, an elastic limit. As soon as the elastic limit is overcome, you break the bond and material slips along various slip temperatures. The big thing is most materials and metals in these cases, once they cool down from a liquid, they don't form very nice little lattices. You have various dislocations and impurities and effects within the material. So here typically you can see, there you can see a, some more like two-dimensional representation of what is called an edge effect. Um, and as you pull it, you can see interaction between dislocations as well. So the, 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 the bonds move and shift and the material deforms plastic. Most importantly, we have, the, the, if you look at this as a specific material crystal, at a microstructural level, you have various orientated crystals. So the, the material gets even more complex. And as you deform this, yet again, the odds of slip happening between atoms increase. Now we're going to try and model that at a, at a, at a more continuum level. And I'm going to start with just looking at some of the experimental data for copper. And this is, this is a specific copper set that I've, I've taken from, from a, a, a PhD that was, that was done 20 years ago. Um, and in this case, what they had is they, they had a cylindrical copper specimen that they compressed at various temperatures, well lubricated, so that you don't have a lot of frictional effects, compressed it at various temperatures and rates. And you can see typically at room temperature, that's the very top blue set of curves. If you compress it at 6,000 per second, so essentially changing, you know, it, it's, it's a ballistic type of speed, you see these highly, highly, highly um, hard, hardened curves with a lot of like jaggedy effects typically as being slip. And then if you go down in terms of strain rate, you can see the lowest strain rate, the curves kind of go down. If you go even down even further, you start getting, at high temperatures, you start getting very interesting effects where material starts to recrystallize. And there's, there's a lot of like thermal diffusion of uh, interactions between the molecules and these things. So dislocations can start to diffuse as well as recrystallize. So grains would start reforming and a new virgin mineral is created in locations where you had a very high concentration of dislocation. So really, I mean, materials deform pretty complexly in terms of temperatures and rates. It's not just a very simple saying, this is how a material deforms, plastic. This is a pure, a, a very commercially pure copper. So as soon as you also add atoms of different shapes and sizes, these kind of impinge on the grain boundary moving and okay. So, so things start getting far more complex once you have the melting temperature of something like copper versus cobalt and stuff within a specific alloy. Yeah, more importantly, you can see the rate dependence of plasticity. So in this specific case, you would deform a material and then change the deformation rate or temperature. And you can see that it doesn't simply jump from one curve to the next. It has a history effect. Here again, the same thing. Down the, the far right down, you can see the effect of waiting for a bit longer and the effect on recrystallization, just in terms of the time effects, not even rate effects, but the, the effect of waiting for a bit longer. So very clearly, we need a state variable based plasticity formulation that better captures this history dependence. And one such model is the mechanical threshold stress model. Now, this model does not take into account thermal diffusion and recrystallization, but it is a fairly well thought out and physically based state variable based model that has temperature and rate dependence. Just because we all do a bit of math, I'll just show you that this is based on, on a, a bit of math that you implement and that I implemented into the Fortran code. Essentially, you have this yield stress. The, 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 the limit where your material starts to deform plastic. And this is essentially broken down into three components. One, a thermal component that is present no matter what rate and temperature you deform it at. And then you have a constant component that simply scales with temperature and rate. And you have an internal evolving component. That's the one on the far right. Typically, you have these scaling functions that follow some Marinius kind of like formulation to, to look at temperature and rate effects. You also have the shear modulus, the elastic component of materials, also temperature dependent. Then we have this uh, formulation, this evolution equation of the internal state of stress. That's just a, a, a Bose work hardening law. And we have a saturation stress that is temperature and rate dependent again. So it deforms, but at different, at different saturate, it will saturate at different stresses. 
based on the temperature to which you form it. Yeah, it's just putting some of the data, so you can see on the left hand side there, that's some of the copper data, I've not used all of it because I, I could not include the recrystallization part of it. And typically you would start by removing the elastic strains, looking at what's the initial yield, using you know, Fisher plots to kind of like find the, the intersection with either the epsis or the ordinate axis and then derive various of these physical quantities from these uh, regressions. There you can see once I've removed the first part, we have the hardening. You, we kind of like extrapolate those uh, at, the, at the top right to find the temperature and rate dependent saturation stress. We plot those along the line, we get more functions. And then finally, we put the, the, uh, the hardening curve. And then, based on all of our assumptions, we can see we didn't do that bad if you look at the top, uh, at the bottom one in terms of the, the model prediction compared to the, uh, the, the experimental data, but that's not sufficient. We want to then take all these parameters that we've kind of estimated, and we want to fine tune them. Fine tune them using the we're using a bit of an optimization procedure. Now I'm going to show the optimization part just for an aluminium thing, and then basically the parameters we estimated from these curves are those seven. And what we do is we take these seven, we take that as a set of input parameters, and we write an optimization curve or an optimization procedure comparing model prediction to experimental data and fine-tuning these parameter values up to a point where we're fairly happy with the way the model predicts physics. And that's what you see on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, all the dots are essentially the experimental data for this aluminium alloy at different temperatures and rates. And on the right-hand side, you can see the model predicted response, the, the stresses and strains that the model predicts at those temperatures and rates. Now that we have this model, and I've implemented that into a bio element package, we can solve the boundary value problem. And essentially, in this case, what I did is I modeled, again, a 300 millimeter thick slab of aluminium at 300 degrees Celsius, and it, it's reduced to about 10% its original thickness in terms of true logarithmic uh, reduction. Now, the road, as you can see there, is one and a half meters in diameter, and it has a peripheral velocity of one meter per second. You know, and we're doing only half of it, as I said. Uh, we're doing a, a fully isothermal uh, analysis, and we're only modeling a, 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 a meter length of the slab because we just want to get past the initial edge effect. So essentially, the, the slab is pushed into the rotating rollers, and at some point, friction takes over and starts pulling them through. And we just want to get past the edge effect and actually see the more steady state developed torque to kind of get an idea of what the work is required to deform this piece of metal. And I did it using various element types and uh, uh, formulations in advocates, including inertia effects versus switching off that bar of physics and all these kinds of things, just to simplify the equations. And then we can kind of have a look at what the, the strains and shears and stresses and strain rates are through this model as it's deformed, which is, you know, makes look some few pretty, few, few pretty pictures. More importantly, it's, it's kind of very important when we have this transient simulation to be aware of the effects of choosing step sizes just because the model has an adaptive time stepping and then chooses to do a larger time step could very well, because of the rate dependence of the material model, mean that you have this cyclic response in, in the actual through thickness variation. So the one at the bottom very clearly does not look like it's developed a steady state because it's jumped between different step sizes as it's moved along. It's very important to have small enough time step sizes considering the speed at which it's processed compared to the size of the elements. Those of you who are familiar with something like CFD, it's very similar to like the, the waves and, and that you need to take into account in terms of like Coulomb numbers and these kinds of things, where you actually don't miss the deformation moving through a specific element. So that's something like that. Um, and now we can also have some, some video. So here you can see, could be at the bottom, it's, it's, the, it's the cyclic ones versus at the top using quadratic elements with very small time step sizes as it deforms the same, the same piece of material. You, know, you can see kind of like just again the importance of, of using small step sizes and accurate elements in terms of developing the steady state process. We also have deformation rate. So here you can see very clearly that it's, it would be better to use a bilinear element at the bottom that has a fairly consistent prediction of what the deformation rates are compared to the higher order quadratic elements. In this specific case, because of the fact that quadratic elements are very, very temperamental when it comes to contact formation. 
I'll just show that again. So there you can see, again, it's a cyclic behavior in the, in the prediction of the deformation rate at the top versus the fairly steady state deformation rate at the bottom. Now, what we're really interested in is, again, here you can see the predictions in terms of the moments and reaction forces on the road. So we can use these as some kind of analog for the amount of energy required. And this was in case this was just a test between different physic formulation, physical formulations, actually including versus excluding inertia effects in these things, as well as different element formulations and so on. So we can just see that we actually have obtained a similar solution. More importantly, once we start rolling these things at different, temp different velocities, you can see here what I've taken is I've, I've taken the radial uh, change in the roller compared to the actual torque required and the velocity of the, of, the, of the material process to kind of rework that into the work required in terms of joules per the volume of material process. So here again, you can kind of see that at a slower deformation rate, the material would deform in such a way that you require less energy to perform it to specific things. More importantly, this was done at elevated temperatures. So this is only an isothermal uh, simulation. Once you start having a cool down effect, we'd also expect that the very, very slow one would actually not have a constant um, work per volume, but it, it would actually increase as it cools down and it gets harder and harder and harder to deform. So those are kind of interesting things that we can now also model if we, if we want to include more physics, actually just take into account the cool down and heat transfer between rollers and, and the just cool down of the, of the bulk material. Just uh, to look at an additional material model formulation. I've taken a lot of the theory behind the mechanical threshold stress model and included additional physics to also take into account thermal recovery, recovery and recrystallization. So, I mean, you remember this curve of all the uh, copper data deforming at various temperatures, and especially the elevated temperatures where it recrystallized. And you can see in the red curve, there are certain instances where you have a single uh, maximum stress, and then it kind of like goes down into a, a steady state versus like multiple cycles of recrystallization at the, the, the you know, second from, from the bottom curve as well. So essentially what I have is I've taken a lot of the basics. So essentially we have this formulation. I've, I've removed one of the components of the um, mechanical threshold stress just to reduce the amount of uh, parameters tuned. And now my internal state variable that essentially evolves as a function of deformation rates and temperatures, I've chosen a slightly different representation of it, where essentially it's compared to a, a, an original or a, a stress-free uh, dislocation density ratio within the material itself. And then I have a dislocation density ratio internal state variable. Now, th in the state variable, you can see where we originally had that Bose model that was quite simple. Here, we've included a lot of different effects. So we've included misorientation in the grains as they deform. We've included multiple cycles of recrystallization where some of the material get gets eradicated based on the creation of new element, new grains within the material on these things. So it's a, it's a slightly more, more complex uh, evolution equation. And in this specific case, it also has multiple cycles. So as soon as a new material recrystallizes, you can also deform that further. And that, again, creates dislocation within that up to a point where that's sufficient. And it again recrystallizes. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a staggered recrystallization, just a mean field approach to metal crystallization. And in this case, you can just see the actual rate forms of the, volume, the recrystallized volume fraction as well as how that is, that is calculated. And when we do this, we can kind of get, get some, of these, some of these plots. So here you can see on, on the left-hand side, you can see as the material is deformed, it kind of recrystallized. And as soon as it, it hits 100% recrystallized, essentially none of the original material is there. It's all been recrystallized, and it's a new material with new orientations and new grain. And this can happen multiple, multiple times. And then you can see on the right-hand side, you can kind of like see the average dislocation densities within the material as it, as it forms and deforms and recrystallizes producing far more complex responses based on, on temperature and rate. And we've tuned this to some degree to actually fit the copper data as well. And this was quite a feat. <laughs> so this took quite a bit of time. So um, here you can again see what, once it starts activating and recrystallizing, and you have 
small diffusion and you have recrystallization at multiple fractions and all these things. And there's a, there's a lot going on there in terms of modeling this, even in a continuum you do that. Now, what I've done is I've also tuned this material model for specifically for static recrystallization and high strength, low alloy steels. And what we have is we have, again, we have cylindrical specimens compressed at various temperatures and rates. And we have various reduction schedules. So typically, you can see the schedule, schedule number one, if you can see that on the left-hand side. Essentially, we have a piece of material that's deformed at a rate of 0 0.3 at a temperature of 1,150 degrees Celsius, right? Or only 7% of its original height. Then it's deformed at a slightly higher rate, again, 7%, 7%. 7%. So you have all of these interactions between waiting 10 seconds between each interpass time versus compressing it again, and then leaving it to recrystallize and compressing it again. And when we get this, you can see on the right-hand side, those images are three different specimens tested for schedule five, uh, schedule six, sorry. So reducing the specimen by about 15% and then waiting 10 seconds versus waiting 20 seconds. And you can see kind of like the temperature, the blue line on the right, how it cools down very slowly as this happens as well. So you have a slowly decreasing temperature while you compress it, waiting, compressing, waiting, and then seeing at the very end, just quenching it, and then that's, that's the, the sharp drop in, in, in temperature. And at the bottom, you can see the actual structural response of this material. So you can see the original, there is some variability in terms of the material itself. But you compress it, you wait a bit, and some of it gets reset. You compress it again, some of it gets reset again. And you can see at the very end, you end up having quite a bit of difference in terms of the structural response of this material based on its different processing histories. And we have quite a bit of these data sets, and we tune this material model to that. So here you can see again tuning the material model so that all its parameters kind of like predict what the structural response is. And the blue, uh, the, sorry, the green, green curves I've essentially used within the optimization procedure, and the red curves I've used kind of like as a validation step. So without testing it, you can see specifically, you know, some of them do fairly well at predicting what it would look like, despite the fact that it's not seen that exact history. So despite the fact that it's not seen the, split, the exact deformation curves in the lower bottom, for example, you can see that we've very, very come very close to actually modeling the structural response of the material considering that temperature and strain rate history. This is another quick validation. We just simulated the actual experimental procedure. And the, these are just internal state variables as they go through. And there you can just see modeling the actual you know, finite element model of it versus just a single point integration that I used for the characterization of the material model. You see that we do fairly well. Now, we get back to our original problem, where we want to do different role reduction schedules and we want to see, considering this high strength, low alloy steel, what is the effect on the through thickness variation of the final product? So if we reduce it, for example, say 30 millimeters, 30 millimeters, 30 millimeters for this off section, what is, what is the through thickness variation? If we instead reduce it 20, 40, 30, what, what, how does that look? And we can kind of look at the residual stresses and residual plastic strains and deformations within the material once we've gone through all these all these deformations. And then you can just see again a very simple little example of what happens. So essentially it is that um, it's that boundary value bomb that I I'm I'm showing there, 30 centimeters, then 60, then 90 for a total reduction of 90 for the symmetry of the problem. And then it's first pulled through up to a point, then it's left for 10 seconds, then the second roller gets pressed into it and it gets rolled through that's left for 10 seconds, and then the final roller gets pressed into it and rolled through. Just so we can kind of like, only look at slightly downstream from, from the roller, what happens. We don't want to model a full section of the material. We just kind of want to see what happens to the through thickness variation of the material. And that's essentially what you see there. That's why you have those odd edge effects at the end. Very clearly, I mean, some of the uh, rollers get pressed in and rolled, and it's, it's moved past it for some, for some you know, for quite, quite a bit of length. But Doing various of these, you know, possible reductions, you know, 30, 30, 30 versus 20, 30, 40, 20, 40, 30. So all of these combinations up to a point where we have 90 um, millimeter reduction for the, for the half. You can see there's fairly similar residual stresses, but you can see on the right hand side, specifically at the top, you can kind of see 
the residual dislocation densities within the material. And in this specific case, again, uh, perhaps once you've built a bit of an intuition about it because it's a logarithmic reduction, it would make sense to reduce it quite a, quite a bit to start off with and then slightly less and slightly less. So in this specific case, <coughs> The, the roll schedule that was 40 millimeters and then 30 millimeters and then 20 millimeters is that black line. So that's, it's that fairly, fairly straight, fairly homogeneous line through the thickness you can see at the top. Versus the other one, the other extreme doing 20, then 30, then 40 millimeters is the green one at the top. So those are the two extremes. So the one would be far more functionally graded. So you would expect that at the very surface of the material, it's slightly harder than at the middle. Whereas the other method would mean it would be fairly consistent in terms of strength throughout the material. So we have this now. Uh, it's just a bit of stuff that I'm currently working on and hoping to work on. Uh, in the first case, you remember the cyclic response of the interaction between the elements and the roller as it comes in and out of contact. I would like to get rid of that by using a mixed Eulerian Lagrangian frame. I have set up a lot of that in my own fine element code, but I have not resolved the contact issue. Uh, so I need, to, I need to work on the contact in order to have that as well. So then in that specific case, you have an, Euler an Eulerian reference frame where you have the velocity of the materials through the mesh, essentially, while you have a Lagrangian reference frame in a through thickness so you can actually still capture the surface uh, pretty, pretty uh, accurately. Another thing is now that we have this model that actually predicts the amount of work produced per, you know, volume of material. Um, I'd like to also do a, a, a huge surrogate-based optimization thing to actually get the, for example, process and determine what is the best set of parameters to get, to put the least amount of energy in to get the specific thickness, for example. So I'd, I'd like to do that as well. And I, I hope to actually go to the guys at Uleman in Peter Maritzburg, where they actually enroll the aluminium. I spoke to some of the guys at the uh, last week um, on advanced materials. So hopefully I can go there and get some real data so I can process that. And then the big thing is coupling the actual microstructure, coupling grains and sizes and orientations and grain boundary sliding and all the other physical phenomena, coupling some of that into, into the material model, having actual textual evolution. Um, the next big thing is also looking at the contact between the rollers and slab as well. So they're looking at advanced material uh, models or uh, contact algorithms that actually deal with lubricated contacts. At the moment, it's just pure column, uh, column uh, contact. Mm -hmm. And that, thank you for being here, is it? <laughs> um, <laughs> there are some useful links. A lot of the stuff uh, you can see on my own website. I also have a lot of code, material models and stuff, and Python scripts and things that I've got on GitHub, if you want to play around with that. Um, if you're interested in simulation, modeling and simulation, um, the OpenSimSA is an open source simulation initiative. Um, there's a lot of information and tutorials and things about using fine element methods and CFD and uh, software and these things on OpenSimSA. Calculix is uh, an open source fine element uh, solver, so check that out. And then the other option is also uh, to look at FreeCAD, Free uh, which is a parametric CAD um, package where you can essentially draw various computational domains and boundaries and things and actually solve stresses and strains within them. And if you want to use some of my models, just download them from GitHub and dump them in there. Great. Thank you.